Hello and welcome back to the Box Office Poison podcast. My name is Moxie McMurder and today I'm joined by Matt Rogerson. You hello. can say hello. <laughs> um, and the reason I chose Matt to talk to today um, is because I believe the conspiracy thriller Coma was the one that got us talking about this yes. on Twitter. Is that right? That's you the haven't one. seen it before. No, it was a completely new watch for me, um, all thanks to your recommendation. <laughs> um, well, let's let's start with Coma, just because that's the one that got us into this. Sure. Um, it's um, a medical conspiracy thriller written by, is it Robin Cook, I think? I think you're right, yeah. And directed by Michael Crichton, if I believe correctly. Yes. <laughs> Yes, Michael Crichton of uh, Jurassic Park fame. I actually really mm. like his books, just as a side note. I I don't think I've read a single one of his books to my shame. Um, oh. But I for for a writer, I think he makes a really good movie director. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, just taking Coma as an example is oh, it's I just think it's perfect. <laughs> quite frankly. Um, I love that uh, Michael Douglas plays a, how shall we put this kindly? Um, <laughs> an awful dickhead. <laughs> he, he, he is a, he's a bad knob, isn't he? He is, isn't he? Just so full of himself. Yep. Yeah, really full of himself. Um, a bit. I, I don't know if we'll go so far as to say misogynistic, but certainly chauvinistic. Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, Definitely. Um, yeah, just just all round bit of a dick. Yeah, he really is. Uh, but we, but we can get back into that. Sorry, this is a little bit all over the place today. But um, so you had never seen Coma before. Had you even heard of it? No, I hadn't. I had no idea that this actually existed as a film. No. Yeah. So tell me, um, tell me what you thought of Coma then. I absolutely loved it. Um, which, uh, to, to no surprise, because I mean, this is one of my, my favorite eras for, for cinema and uh, one of my favorite genres as well. Mm. Uh, but I, I absolutely loved it. I particularly loved um, Yenevieve Behold, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't know. I'm not I French. wasn't sure how you pronounced uh, her name. I, Genevieve Behold? I'm, I'm really not sure. Well, I mean, we'll we'll both carry on, and and for every time I get it wrong, apologies, <laughs> Genevieve. Genevieve. Yeah, <laughs> she's fantastic in the film. Oh, she is. She she carries it perfectly. Um, I I think the only thing better than like an, an underdog every man character is an underdog every woman. Um, of course, I can believe that she's not going to win in the end. I was brought up in yeah. patriarchy. Um, <laughs> that's all you need to convince yourself that a woman's going to fail. Um, yeah. So all the way through, right the way through to the, the, the final scenes, I'm like, she, she's not going to do this. She's not going to do this. She, yeah. She's, no, she's failing. She's failing. She's failing. Oh, my God, she's done it. Yeah. I think one of the really interesting things about Coma is that it's a woman who's the protagonist. Because mm. normally in conspiracy theories, it's men. It's very male-based. It is. Um, and I like that they play with the sexism in that film and the casual... For example, there's a, a scene quite early on in the film when uh, Genevieve comes back from the hospital. She's done her shift mm -hmm. and she goes straight to the bathroom and tries to have a shower. Meanwhile, Michael Douglas, her boyfriend, is sort of following her around the room, talking at her, <laughs> and gets annoyed that she's in the shower first because, you know, he's got things to do. Yeah, and, and his tea's not on the table. Yeah, and, and he's got this kind of, why aren't you interested in my day? I'm trying to tell you about my day, and she's just not having any of it. <laughs> I, I, and that's what I really love about her character as well. She's 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 not subjugated to any of the men in her life, mm. not even the one she's in a relationship with. And yeah. she, yeah, like I say, she's having none of it. Women. Christ. Absolutely. I love that about her. Um, and I really like, uh, I've got a bit of a thing, I think, for medical-based conspiracy thrillers. Mm-hmm. I think probably because most people don't like going to the hospital, we have a 
general distrust of doctors um and they really play on that they really do me me being a, a lifelong nhs worker this is where i'm supposed to tell you that doctors aren't like that in real life doctors oh, aren't like yeah. that in real life people you can trust the vast <laughs> yes. majority doctors of them are good people yes on the I whole totally... yes on the whole there are the odd one uh that you know lets everybody down but generally speaking they're, they're, they're doctors are good but there is a sort of distrust in hospitals i would say nobody likes going there it's all a little bit beyond us because we don't know about what's going on inside our bodies and it's just all a little bit you've got to put your trust in these people they're going to put you to sleep yeah and you don't know if you're going to wake up again right That's you've really... got to trust these people so it it really plays into that paranoia which of course the um these these kind of thrillers are, are, are built on paranoia so yes. every time you go into a hospital you don't know if you're coming out on your feet or in a box <laughs> true you, you don't um <laughs> it, it's always going to occur to you that actually this might be your last trip anywhere especially yeah. if you get put to sleep yes um i think it's a fear that everybody has and it does it works really well with coma and also they've got the sort of ethical issues behind it as well mm -hmm. um I don't really want to, sp particularly with coma, the rest of the movies we talk about, we're probably going to spoil. So spoiler alert. <laughs> but with coma, I feel like I don't want to say too much about it because not many people have seen it. And I would hope that somebody out there who's listening might want to check it out once we've talked about it. Yeah, I would hope so. I mean, I did after seeing you tweet about it. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I, I couldn't believe I'd, I'd never heard of this this film to my uh, to my shame. So yeah, people, if, if you're not already on this, if you're as late to it as I am, hopefully you're going to get on it and, and really really enjoy it. Oh, there's so much to enjoy in Coma. I cannot recommend it enough. If you like thrillers, if you like conspiracy theories, if you like medical dramas, it, it, it's just all there in a delightful little package. It really is. It really is. Yeah, really impressed me. And I was surprised when I um, had never heard of it before. This was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. I went down a rabbit hole of, I want to watch all the conspiracy theory <laughs> movies. And Coma came up in a search that I did. And I was like, what the hell is that? Never heard of it. Um, and it's just one of these sort of unsung, underrated, under discussed, however you want to put it one of those movies but i would urge anybody to go and see it and i don't want to spoil it for anyone yes yeah, same here it's it's not one that that gets a lot of press when people think about conspiracy thrillers um i i once fell down the exact same rabbit hole that you did and i <laughs> bypassed it completely um, yeah. but it, it, it really is worth a watch it's worth several watches in my yes opinion. yes i agree um is, is there anything else that you'd like to mention about Coma before we... Um, just the, the the performances, even though it it feels like a, a bit of a ragtag cast to me. None of the, none of the pieces look like they're going to fit actors-wise. Um, obviously, you know Genevieve, be old. Sorry, Genevieve, Genevieve. Um, <laughs> No, she's going to put in a really good shift. Um, she's fantastic in uh, Dead Ringers, the the Cronenberg yes. film. Yes. Again, doesn't take any shit from from Jeremy Irons and Jeremy Irons. Um, <laughs> yeah. Michael Douglas, well, he he plays Michael Douglas, doesn't he? But he does it so well. Um, yeah. You, he's not an actor; he's a movie star, and and it was clear right from very early in his career, and it's clear in this film as well. Yeah. But even the the support, um, Rip Torn, despite having yeah. a stupid fucking name, um, puts in a really, really good performance. Yeah. Um, who else? Every, oh, um, Richard, Richard Widmark. Richard Widmark. Oh, is he the guy that plays the um, the head of the hospital? Yes. The, yes. Chief, yeah, the chief of surgery. Yeah. Yeah, creepy dude. Mm. <laughs> really, really good. Um, yeah, yeah it, everyone, everyone puts in a solid performance. It's so watchable. It's just, uh, I don't even know how even to describe it beyond that. Do you know what I mean? It is. It's intensely watchable. Uh, yes. It really, really is. And 
yeah, don't be fooled by the fact that it, it doesn't have your your Robert Redfords and your Warren Bates in it. Um, the the cast are fantastic, well written, well directed. Um, yeah. I'll be watching it again before long. I'm so pleased that you enjoyed it. So pleased. Hey. Oh, sorry, and uh, Tom Selleck as well. Yes, of course. Oh, so, as a patient. Of course. Yes. That's always good. <laughs> so there you go, Doesn't... Magnum fans. Um, so yeah, seventies conspiracy theory movies were mm. they were like big business. Like there was just a lot of them in the seventies, which makes sense uh, because at that time, I guess the public at large were becoming more aware of distrust of the government. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, so. Watergate and the Vietnam War and sort of that kind of post-civil rights era and just everything was kind of cooking in the yeah. 70s. Yeah, the Vietnam War was was already starting to go south for, for the US, but mm. I think, hadn't they just invaded Cambodia as well? It could be. Around I'm so... Um, probably, yeah. Because when... Let me just double check the, the dates here because I am terrible for that. Um, Vietnam War... Because didn't it end, like, in, like, 76? Yeah. Um, oh, okay, 75, it says 75. here. Okay, um, and I'm just looking up. Yeah, uh, Cambodia, they invaded in 1970. Oh, right, okay, yeah. So there's a lot going on, um, and people in general were starting to become, yeah, more aware of the... The toxic influence of the government, basically. Yeah. And a lot of these movies are a kind of reaction to that. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, very much so. Very much so. And I think, um, well, the, there's lots of parallels <laughs> to, to some of our, our top politicians now, particularly yeah. if, you, if you live in the US or, or even the UK. Um, yeah. But, yeah, th that was, it was a real turning point for for the citizens of the United States, I guess, with um, with Vietnam and Cambodia, and then with Nixon absolutely yeah. shit in the bed and letting the whole country down. Yeah. Um, I think also, though, there was, and, and we spoke about this prior to recording, but it, I think you'd struggle to argue a stronger decade for cinema than the 1970s. Um, yeah. You've got the, the permissive 60s had, had kind of led to an explosion of subversive, challenging cinema, no matter what genre. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, of course, it was the new Hollywood period as well, wasn't it? Which, yes, it was. In in my humble opinion, was, was kind of Tinseltown's final golden age. Yes. Uh, and the, oh, the wealth of directors that got started in, in that decade, Robert Altman, yeah. Mel Brooks... Uh, yeah. Francis Ford Coppola, William Coppola. Friedkin. Yeah, uh, De Palma. Some, yeah, Scorsese, De Palma, Scott Sacy, loads yeah. and loads of Sidney Lumet, Alan yeah. Butler. Yeah. Dozens and dozens. Of, we, we, if we wanted to name them all, this would be a, a four-hour podcast, I think. <laughs> it would, it would. But you're right, the 70s is often um, sort of derided, really, and people say, oh, nothing good came out of the 70s. I disagree entirely. It was such an epic decade for movies, for music. It's uh, And like we were saying earlier, in terms of cinema, the 70s, it doesn't matter whether it's a musical, whether it's action, whether it's drama, whether it's horror. There's just a wealth of excellent of cinema in yep. that decade. Sci-fi, yeah. comedy, exploitation, yep. anything yep. you're into. Um, I definitely agree that it was kind of the last hurrah um, of Hollywood and that sort of system of making, if you will, a picture. But you know what? The damn thing is, you've got to be serious about making a picture. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Rather um, than a tent pole. Yeah. Yeah. And so original, and they just have that excellent aesthetic of the 70s, which I just dig. I really do. I was born a bit too late. <laughs> you and me um, both. And I think. I think part of the reason the the seventies suffers in retrospect is because it doesn't have that friendly snazzy nostalgia see, uh, sheen to it. 
like the 80s right. had. So yeah. everybody looks to the 80s. It's all neon and bright lights, big cities and and the 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 decade of, of excess. So it's very yeah. easy to look back on that decade with a sense of nostalgia. Whereas with 70s movies, it's not the case because it's all so grubby and it dirty. Is <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and that sort of that grittiness, that dirtiness, that grubbiness um, is so prevalent in so many of these movies, like Clute, for example. Mm. Did you yeah. rewatch that at all? Um, do you know what? I didn't. That's not one of the ones I, I rewatched in uh, okay. in prep for this. But I, I have a, a relatively decent memory for that film. I hadn't. I couldn't remember it. Most, as, to be fair, really, all I remembered was, um, I was about to call her Glenda Jackson. That's not right. Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda, her, yeah. Yes, her character um, is so brilliant and so, what's the word? She's so progressive. Yes. That it, it must have been startling for people who, it, at the time, because that's what, 71? Yeah, yeah. 71. And she's she's talking filth. <laughs> she, she really you know, is. She's, it's fairly graphic yeah. uh, for 1971. And coming from Jane Fonda and, you know, this from an acting dynasty dynasty um, and who she was and everything. And I don't know. I can just imagine people being really shocked by some of the stuff that came out of her mouth. <laughs> I, I imagine so. I, I can't. Um, I can't imagine it went down well with the uh, with the older demographics. No. <laughs> when she's walking around swearing like a sailor on shore leave. Right. <laughs> yeah. But looking fabulous while she does it. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> she is so stylish in that film. She really, um, really is. I believe she won an Oscar for Clute. Did she? Oh, I think good she on did. her. She. I'm bloody deserves it oh absolutely yeah she's fantastic in that um and i'm not necessarily a big fan of jane fonda but that's one of the ones where i think yeah you deserve that oscar that was that was a really great performance um it, and the whole film oh sorry go on i was just gonna agree it really was um just looking she she was nominated for the oscar um, oh, oh no win? no sorry no that's the bafta forgive <laughs> me that's the bafta Quite right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, she she won the Oscar, won the Best Actress Oscar. I thought she did. Yeah, I know she was she was nominated for the China Syndrome, uh, which is another sort of conspiracy. But that's 1980, so it just misses the mark for us to talk about it. <laughs> but yeah, she she's absolutely incredible in that film. Um, and and like you say, so progressive. And the the attitude is just. Yeah. It's very much the attitude that the seventies would become, but but her character was one of the first really embraced yes. the screen. I thought. Oh yes, now see, being her character is a sex worker mm -hmm. um, in Clute, and you had mentioned this before about oh which one is it? Mm, Three Days of the Condor. That mm. there's problematic sex. <laughs> yes. Shall we say? Yes. And Clute's another example of this. Um, it really is, isn't it? Yeah, it's awkward and a bit like, hang on a minute, the power dynamics in this are way askew. Um, and it, it's always portrayed as consensual. But if you pick it apart, it's like, actually, I don't know about that. That's more no, than it's, it's, it's nothing of the sort, in, in, right? in my opinion. Um Oh, I just mean for Clute. When it comes to Three Days of the Condor, that is absolutely like, what the fuck is happening? Oh, God, yeah. That's that was an uncomfortable watch. Rewatching that film, it surprised me so much. I remember absolutely loving Three Days of the Condor. I remember watching it on telly as a kid and yeah. really, really loving it. And then, yeah, put it back on last week. And all the way through, I'm just slack jawed. Like, this man's a rapist. Yeah. This man's a yeah. rapist and we're all supposed to be cheering for him. Right? Like I said, it's the power dynamics because it's it's all it is portrayed as consensual. You know, she seemingly is enjoying mm. herself and has seemingly been okay with having sex with him. But these power dynamics are off. He kidnapped her for Christ's sake. Absolutely. And tied yeah. her up. The, and 
if anything, she's acquiesced, and and that would even I wouldn't even go that far. Um, yeah, yeah. It's um, well, it, it felt like um, Stockholm syndrome. Yes, yes. Um, and I had I couldn't remember that when I saw you mention it on Twitter, and I was going to rewatch Three Days of the Condor anyway for this podcast. And I was like, what? What happens? I, I don't remember a rape. What's going on? Watched it again. Yeah. It's <laughs> so dodgy. problematic. So dodgy. And, and Clute has the similar sort of setup, yes. which is muddied even further, I think, possibly because she's a sex worker. Mm. So there's like that audience perception of she's OK with it. But again, stop, pick it apart. The balance is off. You yeah. know, they're not on an equal footing i mean she yeah you you could argue she's okay with it but they've got this abusive client and they're just passing yes. them on from one girl to the next and, Ab- and he's just he's doing the rounds he's having a whale of a time abusing all these poor prostitutes and yeah that's yeah that that's not right it really right, absolutely but i feel like at the time there probably was a public perception and to be fair there still is a public perception of sex workers being just sort of okay with anything that happens to them which isn't true yes. and isn't right no um, and that's i guess one of the the issues that maybe some people have when they go back and rewatch these films from you know the 70s it was a different era it was a different time <laughs> <laughs> and you know sexual harassment was happening left right and center and nobody said anything because it was just the way things are yeah right. and if and you've I, got sorry oh no, no i was i was just gonna say and re-watching these old films with a modern day perspective on things i don't personally have a problem with but a lot of people do yes absolutely i i don't either um because it, it gives me the opportunity to pick it apart and say right okay this yeah. isn't all right now yeah. um if if it was made now and made in much the same way with much the same content, I probably wouldn't go to see it. Yeah. I'd, I, I would expect filmmakers of today to, to have, I guess, a, a bit more of an attitude that reflects today's society. And I mean, I know sex workers still don't have the, the protections they should have. Yeah. Um, even now, although sex work, I think is it, it's a bit more normalised these days. You've got yeah, you've got this various various avenues in 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 sex work now. Mm-hmm. But back then, back in the seventies, they they had no protections whatsoever. The, the best protection they could get was a pimp, and you, usually the pimps were abusive to them as well. Yeah, tough times. It, it is. It is. Um, and I think unfortunately for a lot of people today they have such a problem with these problematic parts of the that they won't go back and, and re-watch it or I should say watch it for the first time yeah and I I get that I mean we all yeah. have our line don't we I mean yeah. as far as I'm concerned anything that's been made by a nonce I'm, I'm not going anywhere <laughs> near it yeah, um, that, that's my line money. yeah absolutely um the example I always use is Rosemary's Baby um because mm. people have such a problem understandably with Polanski um because you know he's a rapist a child yes. rapist yes he is you must never forget um but i think rosemary's baby is a fucking masterpiece uh but that said if say criterion released a super sexy version of rosemary's baby i wouldn't buy it no. Because I don't want any of my money going to Polanski. I will buy a second-hand copy. I will torrent it. I will do whatever I need to to get my hands on it. But I'm not giving him my money. Absolutely. I'm more than happy for um, for my viewing pleasure of that film to go to Pirate Bay. But I, I certainly yeah. wouldn't, be, wouldn't be popping down HMV or, or jumping on um, jumping on Amazon to, to buy it. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's it's difficult with with a number of these films and not everything's on the on the level of um Rosemary's Baby and, and Polanski but like you say with films like Clutes with films like Three Days of the Condor you look at it now and it's yeah it, it doesn't mm. go over well I no. couldn't root for Robert Redford in that film no. I, I I remember getting to a point where I'm like right I'm, I'm in Max von Sydow's camp <laughs> yeah as far as I'm concerned Max von Sydow's the goodie from here on out <laughs> 
um it, yeah three days of the condor it's um i remember really enjoying it the first time i saw it but the second time i watched it like you say it was a bit problematic in places and i don't know i didn't find it quite as gripping as i remembered it being yeah i same i mean i i still appreciate it is a really well put together film yeah but i do find it lacking in certain areas um i think Robert Redford spends a lot of the time not doing very much, just going back to the apartment with her, staying for a bit, leaving, going for a bit of a mooch, going back. <laughs> he seems to do that over and over without getting getting much further at all. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't quite have that absolute gripping tension from start to finish that I remembered it having when uh, when I saw it much younger. Yeah. Yeah, same. I, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I couldn't quite, you know, what is the, what's the thing that it's lacking? And I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I was like, yeah, I'm just not as gripped by it as I remembered being. Yeah, same. I yeah. I put it down so, I, I, in retrospect, I find Robert Redford's character a bit passive and I find his his arc a bit a bit passive. The the screenwriter in me um his his brow furrows when I think of, of <laughs> some of the uh, some of the decisions made around his character. But I guess yeah. I guess an actor like Robert Redford, a, a movie star like Robert Redford, you could put him in the Mister Men and he'd he'd somehow manage to make it look good. But yeah, um, a bit passive. For me. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um, one of the films that I meant to rewatch before we did this, but I just didn't have time, was The Conversation. <sighs> it's my favourite. <laughs> Is it? Oh, how annoying. Yeah. I remember little bits of it. Um, so maybe you can take the lead with this one. and Because um, I'm assuming you would recommend The Conversation. Absolutely. Without hesitation. Tell me why. <laughs> uh, I, I, right, I, I shall. I can and will give a convincing argument for why The Conversation is Francis Ford Coppola's best film. And I say <gasps> that, no, yes, I say that knowing full well that he'd made the, the Godfather films either side of it. Um, the, conversation, the Conversation is a perfect movie. It's a perfect movie. The, the screenplay is so tightly written and it, it plays on all our expectations. It, it, has, the, it has the polar opposite of, of dramatic irony. Uh, right. We don't know anything and every tiny reveal changes the complexion of the film entirely for us. Each time we hear that recorded conversation that, that Gene Hackman is obsessing yeah. over, it's the exact same words, the exact same dialogue, but the meaning has changed completely. Mm. each time and it oh I, I could watch it on repeat I, I really <laughs> could um also Gene Hackman Do yes you know fuck Pacino fuck De Niro <laughs> fuck Brando at the end of the day they all play the same role over and over they do it incredibly well for the most part but yeah. you, you've only got to watch De Niro's terrible comedy efforts um <laughs> to realize that as an actor he is actually limited Hackman yeah. can do it all. He plays yeah. the perfect everyman. He can do the, the gritty anti-hero police detective thing that he did in The French Connection. He can yeah. be an action lead in, was it the Poseidon Adventure? Yes, yes yeah. Poseidon Adventure, yeah. yeah. Um, he can be an action lead and, and he can do comedy so well. Yes, he can, yeah. Fantastic. I, 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 Frankenstein. Yeah, I love Gene Hackman. I think he's great. I know that he's uh, a little bit of a, a prickly gentleman in real life, but I don't care. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't want to be his mate. I, no. I just, I just want to watch his films. Um, he's, he, he's Lex Luthor. I can watch again yes. and again and again. Uh, yeah, just, just everything. He, he's a wonderful actor. From what I recall about, <clears throat> excuse me. From what I recall about the conversation. Um, like you mentioned before, he's like obsessed with this recording um, and he's kind of like losing his mind a little bit. I seem to recall shots of him just, yeah, listening over and over in that tiny little room. Yes, he really is. And he's basically, he's, his life and his career is going to shit all around him. 
Uh, and he's just stuck there with this recording that he is absolutely obsessing over. And he, so the film does for me what Three Days of the Condor should have done. He right. spends so much of his time really sitting around doing nothing. And yet he's not the remotest bit passive. He doesn't come across a passive. It always feels like something's happening. The plot's moving along, even if he's sitting still. Yeah. I seem to remember the ending. Um, I mean, should we, I don't know if we should spoil it or not, because again, the conversation, even though it's well regarded, it isn't talked about very much. It isn't. And I think that that's largely because the minute you start talking about Coppola, you start talking about the Godfather. True. Um, so maybe we won't spoil the ending, but from what I recall anyway, the conversation is definitely worth watching because it does flip the script, like like you say, continuously. It, Every it, time you hear it, it takes yeah. on a different meaning. It really does. It, it does it so well, and I can't think of a single film that does that as well as uh, as the conversation does. Yeah. What else did I watch? Um, oh. The Parallax View. <sighs> That's a trippy <laughs> So trippy. So different. I mean, so, um, oh, goodness, I've forgotten his name, the director. Pal- it's Alan-, Pacula. Alan J. Pac- Pacula. Alan J. Pacula. He made three films that they refer to as the Paranoia Trilogy. Yes. Uh, which is All the President's Men, Clute, and... The Parallax View, yeah, I believe. Um, and of the three, the Parallax View is the trippiest, <laughs> most out there. Um, <laughs> feast for the senses of a movie. Absolutely. You get after, after Clutes, which was a, a, a reasonably grounded thriller. Um, yeah. the, obviously very very subversive but reason, reasonably grounded after that success you can tell now he's Pacula's playing he's experimenting yeah. he's, he's seeing what he can get away with the, um, the use of sound and colour is so unique uh, in the parallax, the parallax view um, there are times when the, the sound is really loud times where it's quiet there's background music there's all this stuff going on it's such a immersive film for me Mm. anyway yeah Um, fully agree and i'm not really a fan of warren Beatty at all but there's something about his character that i'm okay with and i go yep sure i'm in (laughs) (laughs) do you know what i'm the same on i i I, I don't rate Beatty at all um whenever i put a film that i've not seen before and then he's big leery mug appears on the screen i'm, I'm instantly <laughs> reaching for the remote control like not beta and I, I can't even put my finger on why but there's certain actors that just turn me off um I tom hanks is exactly one what you mean oh tom hanks oh no yeah I like... everybody likes tom hanks but i know i not know me. But... i can't be doing with him <laughs> i really really can't be doing with him there's just something about him that that turns me off and bait is another one I totally understand what you mean. I have an irrational hatred of certain actors. Um, what's that guy's name? Jesse Eisenberg. As much as I love the social network, I fucking hate that kid. <laughs> oh, yes. He's got a, s- such a slappable face. He really does. And there's just something about him I seriously dislike. And it's irrational. And I'm sure he's a lovely guy in real life. But to me... I can't, I don't even want to look at him. I, he just, <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a whole list of, of irrational hatred for certain actors. <laughs> so I understand you. <laughs> but yeah, the parallax view, it's such a trippy film involving like, uh, oh, oh, now this is the thing I was going to say. One of the things I really like about a conspiracy theory movie mm. is if it's investigative journalism, Yes. I love that. Because then they become the detective that I feel I am. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I really like that. So the Parallax View has uh, a bit of that in terms of he's a journalist, right? Or a writer. Um, 
uh, who gets embroiled in this um, assassin conspiracy theory thing ends up in a crazy assassin school <laughs> where he's brainwashed. <laughs> and oh, that brainwashing scene. Mm. It's so good. It, it lasts so much good. longer than you would expect. It's, yeah. it's, it's almost like it is trying to brainwash you. <laughs> I think that is that that's one of those sequences that that I think about when I think of that film, and it it really is. It, it's it's Pacula pushing the envelope. He's seeing if he can make us feel like we're being brainwashed while we're watching it. I'm sure of yeah. it. Yeah, I'm sure that was that was the intention, and it works because you're like because you, you kind of expect it to cut away at some point, and we'll mm. see what eighty. But we don't. It's just a two two and a half minute solid brainwashing video and the selection of images and words oh it's just so well done yeah it really is really Um, really is and like you say he's pushing the envelope with the sound with the use of color it's um yeah it's something else the parallax view and again it's not one that people often talk about it isn't um even though it's part of that um well, trilogies, they call it. It's more of a triptych than anything. They're, they're yeah. thematically linked, but that's about it. Um, yeah. But whenever talk turns to that, it, of course, turns to all the president's men um, mm-hmm. because of, of what it's about. And, yeah, and yeah I, I think the parallax view and cults unfairly fit, oh, get my words out, unfairly sit in the shadow of, um, of all the president's men. Of all the men. president's men. Yeah, I think you're right. It is the it's like the number one conspiracy theory film. Like if you talk about it, people will mention all the president's men. Yeah. Um, and it's I suppose the because it's based on a true story, of course, uh, mm-hmm. the Watergate scandal and Nixon and Deep Throat and all that jazz. Yeah. Um, perhaps that's why people really latched onto it more than the other two. Yeah, I think maybe. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to undersell it. It's a fantastic film. Oh yeah, um, and and it is one of my favourites in in that that little um, that little pigeonhole. Um, but yeah, it it's a very it's a very um, static and it's a very comfortable film. All the President's mm. Men. There's not a great deal of um discomfort or surrealism or, or all the things that that Pacula really does play with to, to good effect in the parallax view he kind yeah. of strips that all back for for this and and yeah probably because it, it is based on a, a a real life story on a real world event oh, world events yeah yeah i just wondered if that's maybe why people connect with it so much or or at least did at the time <clears throat> i should say yeah i think so I think so. Um, I mean, if if you ask someone if they've seen all the president's men and they've never heard of it, they say, "What's it about?" And all you have to do is say one word: Watergate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instant recognition, then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and so going from there towards a more, I don't really want to say sci-fi because it's not, but things like Capricorn One and the Andromeda strain that take on a more sort of science uh, look at things. <laughs> yes. I, I could have explained that better. I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> what are um, your feelings about uh, Capricorn 1 and the Andromeda strain? I I enjoy Capricorn 1. Um the, the Andromeda Strain, I think, is an absolute masterpiece, and no surprise, because um, virtually everything Robert Wise did was a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, from his early days working with Val Luton on all those weird semi-horror kind of macabre melodramas, right the way through to, well, you've got The Haunting, haven't you? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the absolute top two or three haunting ha- haunted house movies ever made. Um, yeah. Right the way through to his musicals. I'm not a fan yeah. of musicals, but I'll watch Robert Wise's. Oh, absolutely. Well, I love a musical, unsurprisingly. Um, 
and uh yeah i like because he did like the sound of music and um uh, west side, West side story. story one oscars um, for both yeah yeah he's a bit of a powerhouse mm. uh wise but um i i really enjoy capricorn one i think it's fantastic i am slightly biased though because i'm in love with elliot gould, elliot gould. Particular, <laughs> particularly in the 70s you, um, me both so, <laughs> so i will watch it endlessly um because he's lovely <laughs> he is isn't he um, he is. um but oh no go on i there's just there's something about that man. He has buckets of charisma, mm-hmm. more charisma than practically anybody else you'll see on a movie screen. <laughs> um, and he, I, so I have issues with Capricorn One. Um, okay. And again, it's it's the writer in me. I, I have issues with the fact that we have got more than one protagonist. Okay. So we've got. Elliot Gould as the reporter, but we don't actually meet him until I think about 10 or 15 minutes into the film. That's and right, yeah. Prior to that, we've been following James Brolin um, and, and his little crew, OJ Simpson, and the other one. Sorry, other one. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're following um, um, those three. Sam Waterston. Sam Waterston. Sorry, <laughs> Sam, if, if, you, if you're even still alive. Um, yes. Is he? Shit, I, I sorry. I, I'm not sure, actually. Let's find out. We're on the Let's internet. Poor old Sam Waterston. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Is he still alive? This is a bit macabre, isn't it? Um, la, 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 la. He's still alive! Oh, shit. Sorry, Sam. Sorry, Sam. He's 79 years young. Good on you, sir. <laughs> um, anyway. And he, it's, it's terrible that I don't remember because I actually find... His character, the 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 best of the three, I, I find him far more endearing. That that constant um, comedy as anxiety thing he's got going all the way through it. He, he's constantly joking, constantly making sarky comments, and it's very clear it's his way of dealing with his anxiety. And I think that's a, a fantastic trait um, yeah. that his character has. Um, O.J. Simpson doesn't really get to do a great deal but i i'm not gonna um worry about that too much james brolin um i'm not massively sold on i never That's fair enough. i never have been I, I think he's he's a face rather than anything else for me i'm like oh yeah it's that guy um but he's he's set up as our protagonist for the first 15 minutes or so of the film and then elliot gould appears and i'm like what <laughs> in it, and he's only just on the screen now. What are you doing? Yeah, I can and, appreciate that. And then we, yeah, we, we follow him and we follow James Brolin, and I'm only really interested in Elliot Gould. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because how can you be interested in anybody else once Elliot Gould has graced the screen? Oh, I absolutely agree. Like you say, bags of charisma doesn't matter what role he's in um he's just endlessly watchable um Absolutely. and brings a certain wink and a nod to his characters that i enjoy yes yes he's all he th- there's always that self-awareness isn't there yes it's like, it's like he He's kind of projecting that he knows he's in a film and he's <laughs> he's enjoying it so much and having so much fun um, yeah but he gets away with it every single time fantastic actor yeah he is he's brilliant um and perhaps maybe one of the reasons i like capricorn one so much is it kind of plays on the whole um you know like they didn't really land on the moon and it was all a hoax shouldn't they have got stanley kubrick to direct this i <laughs> know right just the most poetic thing <laughs> Absolutely. That would have been brilliant. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it just? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it really does. Um, it, it plays on on this very well received conspiracy thriller that the um, c- uh, conspiracy theory, sorry, that they, they never went to the moon. It's quite easily believed. 
um, yeah. give the background of what was happening. You can see why people would think that it was a it was a put on, yeah. um, and that it was politically motivated. Um, and and yeah, the, this this film very much nods to that, just replacing yeah. them with Mars. Yeah. Um, what? A, oh yeah, the Andromeda Strain. No, that's a complicated film. <laughs> Good lord, I, don't don't pop out for a brew during that one. <laughs> true, true. I actually just bought the um I think it's Arrow released um uh, you know some super duper pro version of the Andromeda strain. Um I'm not sure what the extras are on it. I haven't had a chance to get to it yet, but I'm excited to because the last time I watched the Andromeda strain, I was hooked. Yeah. Absolutely hooked. Like, tell me more. Tell me everything. Oh my god! Oh, I'm, I'm <laughs> not sure. I... So beautifully. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I know everything. I mean, this this will be a good one for people who don't want spoilers because I don't think I can explain the story very well at all. <laughs> it just it it is so so um, deeply meshed into the science of it. It is yes. very much. It's not a science fiction film. It's a science film. Yeah. And it's what feels like real scientists doing real science things um that that just happens to be um based around this this strange what is it this strange strain that has has killed a load of people in a in a remote village. Um mm. the plot moves along so quickly to say that vast swaths of this film are, are, are spent in one location. Mm-hmm. It just bang, 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 bang. Don't don't turn your attention away from it for a second, or you will be lost. Yeah. It um, if, if memory serves, it kind of has a bit of a it, like a claustrophobic feel when they're in the science labs and everything. Oh, very much so. Um. Oh, and again, it was it was written by Michael Crichton. Of course, it was. Oh, well, well, that makes sense. Um. So yeah, and again, that's that's Robert Wise, isn't it? We said it is. Yeah, it is. Um, it's it's hard to do Robert Wise justice as a director because he just everything he makes is just perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got the Midas touch. It's <laughs> it, it means that his his career is it's essentially a flat line, just a very very high one. Um, yes. That he doesn't have those those dips, those peaks and troughs that that pretty much all directors have. Mm. He's just constant, Consistent. yeah, banger after banger for oh decades and decades and decades. Yeah, um, yeah, I I really en- enjoy the Andromeda Strain. It does, like you say, it's not quite sci-fi, but does involve you know space and science and all those sorts of things um yep. for anybody who's slightly more interested in the science uh what's the word a science bent <laughs> yes you know what i mean i know what you mean it, it is it, 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 it's so it's so deeply embedded in the science of the the story um, which, yeah. which undoubtedly comes from from Crichton's writing because he he is very good at that whether it's um this kind of science or whether it's medical science he he clearly does his homework and and yeah. fills his writing with with this detail that that carries across to the the film adaptations i have a vague memory of uh knowing that michael crichton was actually going to be a doctor i think i'm pretty sure he went to medical school ah, well that and... would make a lot of sense yeah um and he was kind of writing on the side and then when the writing really took off that's when he was like do you know what i'm not going to be a doctor i'm going to write instead um so that makes sense that these things feel so genuine Mm. like you said real scientists doing real science yeah and it is and yet it is so entirely gripping yes way through yeah, much like Coma, which, you know, makes sense because he wrote both of them. Yes. But they both have that very uh, medical-based, real science, real, 
reality, a little bit more grounded, even though it's dealing with this, with the Andromeda strain, this strange alien, perhaps, whatever the hell it is. Mm. Um, it's still based in a, like a realistic realism, people going about their day, doing their job. It's, um, yeah. Very enjoy much that. so. Yeah, very much so. Um, it, it It doesn't get bogged down by the need to have action yes like like a lot of films can do especially if they're, if they're based on on um works or scripts that that have a lot of of scientific detail in them mm-hmm. you give it to a director and then all of a sudden like right no they've got to be going somewhere they've got to be doing something more explosions <laughs> yeah. uh none of this with the andromeda strain it's so comfortable in that deeply deeply scientific setting Mm. Um, and yeah, Robert Wise just, he, he lets the screenplay, um, tell its story. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that's quite common with, um, I would say seventies films in general, but for the ones that we've discussed, they're very comfortable in silence. Yes. Which isn't something that directors these days, generally speaking, um, are not that comfortable with. They think the audience is just going to check out. <laughs> certainly, um, yeah, certainly not the the bigger directors today. I mean, I'd challenge you to um, to watch a Michael Bay film without getting a migraine. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, there's not a moment of let up, not a moment of silence, and yeah. and the same with the likes of um, well, uh, James Cameron. It's it's all even though he's been directing for decades and decades he's he's more recent um films yeah there's none of that silence there's none of of that comfort it's all got to be keep their attention keep their attention keep their attention yeah yeah Um, whereas a film like andromeda strain it does keep your attention and it um i i liken it to something i I learned from being a pro wrestling fan is that that there are yeah, I know. Um, th- yeah, that was unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit of a weird turn. But there are there are certain certain performers in in pro wrestling who, rather than doing the whole shouty over the top ripping their shirt off things in their promos, what they do instead is they talk very quietly and very slowly and deliberately, and they're they're really telling this story and they're drawing you further and further in because you've almost got to strain to hear them. Yeah. So you give them that bit more of your attention and yeah, yeah. you suddenly find that they've they've got you, they've completely won you over. Um, same with this film. Yeah, absolutely. And it was the same in Clute as well. There's um, a moment where, um, I was going to say Kiefer Sutherland, Donald Sutherland um, notices that someone is on the roof of this building that he's in with uh, Jane Fonda yes. and they go silent and there's just silence and it happens in a lot of these films. They, they're they so comfortable with taking a pause, even if the pause is an uncomfortable one. Mm-hmm. They're, they're comfortable in showing you that pause. And like you say, you're almost leaning in. You're waiting for that reaction or the whatever the person's going to say. And it draws you in a bit more. And I like that about these sorts of films. You and me both. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, yeah. You've only got to look at something like uh, The Exorcist. Mm. Which it is it it's not only comfortable in those silent moments, it revels in them. Yes. So yeah. much of that film is spent in either silence or, or very, very hushed voices. Mm-hmm. Um slow, quiet conversations between these two priests. Very little action wise actually goes on. And and I, I guess that's yeah. led to in, in recent years you you, you you hear the the younger generation going back and watching it, and really not thinking it's all that, um, because they're yeah. expecting to be, they're they're expecting a ghost train ride. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and you don't get that from that film, and and yeah, it's very much the same with Clue. It's very much the same with the Andromeda Strain, and so many of those films in in the seventies, where I guess the the directors was just so self assured. Yeah. Yeah, confidence. They knew that the audience would either accept it or not, and they're going to do it, and that's the end of that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and it was all again, it's that whole raft of directors that mm-hmm. that started working in the in either the very late sixties or, or the early seventies, who have all had really, really solid and, and often spectacular careers. Yeah. Um, in in films, not movies, in films. Yeah. These are yeah, these are films. These aren't things that are going to open in the middle of summer and yeah. draw hundreds of millions, if not billions of, of dollars. Um, they're films that people are going to go and sit down and watch and pay attention to and listen to. And absorb. And yes, absorb it and then be talking about them for so long afterwards. Um so, so swinging it back to our our conspiracy uh, yes. thrillers, do you have like a favorite setup? Is it the investigative journalism? Is it a medical one? Is it a political one? Do you have a favorite, or do you just uh, love them? It's um, the political setup, absolutely for me. I'm yeah. so mistrustful of politicians and people in power in general, uh, and rightly so, as they do keep out in themselves as being both clandestine and inept, um, yes. which is an incredibly potent combination. Um, I just, I really lean in to, to political conspiracy thrillers mm. so, so much. Um, all three of, of the Pacula films, Clute, Parallax View, All the President's Men, um, The Conversation, which we talked yeah. about, Three Days of the Condor, until I rewatched it and it turned out he's a bad rapist um <laughs> that would be my absolute favorite but i would say that the science setup is not far behind that um yeah. andromeda strain invasion of the body snatchers uh the coma which we yeah. talked about and then of course the the china syndrome capricorn one yeah. um yeah yeah Poli- political first and foremost science not far behind yeah I I think I'm really more uh, I enjoy a political one, but I really get into the medical ones for some reason. They scratch an itch I didn't know I had. <laughs> um, whether it's coma, whether it's um, extreme measures, um, you know, contagion side effects. I love those so much. I'm gone. Um, on. I'm writing all these down because I'm not seeing. Oh, it. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. Extreme measures, contagion. Contagion and side effects. Thank you. They're all excellent, in my opinion. Extreme measures is a good one for you, perhaps, because it has um, Gene Hackman. Yes. It It also has Hugh Grant. I know people have opinions. Ah. I like him. (laughs) Um, I have such a soft spot for Hugh Grant. So, uh, yes, I really enjoy Extreme Measures. It has that same, I almost, I think it might even be another Michael Crichton, but I, I may have that wrong, so don't quote me. But um, I do really enjoy the the more medical ones because I think it's preying on a fear I already have of hospitals. Uh-huh. It, it plays with ethics and what you can and can't and what you should and shouldn't do if you're a medical professional. Um, it's got sort of conspiracy running through it, lies, mystery, intrigue. Um, yeah, I, I think medical is my my go to when it comes to these things. Fair play. Oh, it's got David Morse in it. Who's there? Uh, he's from Twelve Monkeys. Uh, he was oh. in the the ancient TV series and elsewhere. Um, oh, I remember that. I grew that. up watching, and I think just about every Stephen King adaptation that's ever been made. I um, he always See? seems to turn up in them. Uh, he's definitely in the Green Mile, for one. Was he in Extreme Measures? Yeah. What's his name again? David Morse. David Morris, let's have a look at you. Um, oh, yes, let's see, let's see. I can't picture who he is, but I'm sure I'll know him when I see him. You will. I'm sure you will. Come on, internet. Oh, yes, of course. Of course, <laughs> that guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's never a good guy. Mistrust nope. him. Like, just run away if you see that guy. Run Absolutely. away. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's always up to no good. Um, yes. Right the way throughout his entire career. He yes, does it he so go to well. Way. So well. 
Yes. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I really like Extreme Measures. I think it's good, but the the others are are excellent as well. Contagion, side effects, coma. <laughs> um, Fantastic. I think it's interesting that I mean, obviously, real world events influenced these seventies paranoia conspiracy films. Mm. Why do you think we don't get so many of them these days? If, I mean, considering, you know, the government in the UK and the government in America is fucked. So why aren't yep. more filmmakers diving into that? I um, I think we, we, we're in the, the exact kind of climate right now that could see a boom in them again. Um, when, when all this um, COVID business has died down, um, yeah. and, and hopefully we're not all dead and people can start making films again because I'm, I'm running out of them <laughs> and I need some <laughs> new ones. I, I could quite easily see a new wave of conspiracy thrillers being well received. Um, yeah. as, for, as for why they, they kind of stopped being made, I, I do have big opinions about this that um I, i've got into many arguments with with people about um i i will state that two men are responsible for the death of the conspiracy thriller and the death of the new hollywood movement those men steven spielberg and george lucas oh controversial again i'm yeah. loving this well continue <laughs> jaws and star wars um, and I'm not speaking to the quality of either film. I love Jaws. It's a yeah. fantastic film. Um, it's an absolute masterpiece. And to say that they really thought they weren't going to be able to pull it off. Um, yeah, wonderful, wonderful film. Um, Star Wars obviously has influenced a, an entire genre of, of kind of sci-fi soap opera um, and got probably the the most committed fan base of, of any set of films ever yeah. however they ushered in the era of the blockbuster and we've never left it it's it's it started with those two films um jaws was a huge summer hit i believe yeah. star wars was a huge summer hit as well and yeah. then all of a sudden everyone everyone in the studios realized hey if we can make more of these big summer hits we can make more money yeah and it, it yeah. carried carried on through the eighties, um, through the nineties, and it's kind of it's almost gone to its logical conclusion now. Because um, unless you've got superheroes, Transformers, or The Rock, you ain't getting a decent box office. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> Everything else has been pushed to the side, um, so the the Hollywood financiers get more and more money. Um, yeah. the, the Hollywood producers get more and more nervous about all these humongous box office receipts they're expected to deliver just mm -hmm. in order to make a bunch of parasitic billionaires even fucking richer while the rest of us fucking starve. <laughs> um, uh, no, I feel you. I feel you. They did have a go at bringing these back in, in like the late 90s, around the turn of the millennium. Yeah, I was going to say, there's there's a few, actually. That's, I mean, there's a couple of good ones from the 80s as well. But um, speaking more recently with things like uh, Arlington Road and The Constant Gardener, which I think yeah. were sort of late 90s, early 2000s, I think. Um, yeah, I think The, the Constant Gardener was probably the, the latter end of that of that period. It was... Yeah. But they made these films and they... See, they're what I would call, they're not pessimistic, they're cynical. They're, they're very cynical. But that's properties. why we like them. No, that, 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 that's not what I mean. I mean, they're, they're made cynically nowadays. They're, when, when oh, they I see what you out, mean. I see what you mean. They're, they're calling cards for directors who want to go on to make blockbusters in the Hollywood machine. So um, Christopher Nolan did it with Memento. Um, which I still think is a cracking thriller. It's not quite as clever as it thinks it is, but I, I still really, really enjoy it. But then he went he went from that to doing three Batman films, and now he's desperately trying to be the, the man who defeated coronavirus and saved cinema with his, his latest blockbuster. 
Um, yeah. You've got The Usual Suspects, which I, I can't watch anymore because it was made by a massive nonce, uh, allegedly, yeah. um, for the mm-hmm. for the lawyers out there. Alleged nonce. Yeah, um, alleged. He, he then went on to do X-Men films, Superman. Yeah, uh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and and then it turns out it was all just done to finance his real career as a sexual predator, um, allegedly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but even um, Alinta Road, which I rewatched just last week, and and I still absolutely love. I looked up um, the writer, so mm-hmm. it's written by Aaron Kruger, uh, no relation to Freddy, um, <laughs> and and then I looked up to see what he's done since. Fucking Transformers. Really? He writes, yeah, he writes the Transformers films. Wow. And and that's happened with, with every one of them that, that, that came in. They, it was a new director. They would do something really genuinely clever, pessimistic, dark thriller, mm. and then get snapped up to, to go and work in the Hollywood machine. Interesting. I had not picked up on that at all. Wow. That's kind of... Well, there's probably exceptions, um, but, yeah. but there, w- there will be exceptions. Every single one I can think of, they've done yeah. one. Um, and they've, yeah, they, they've gone on to, to, to being big blockbuster film directors because that's where the work is these days and that's where the money is these days. Where if you were to give them a little bit more of a chance, if you'd say, well, you did really well with that tight little thriller, what mm. if we gave you a moderate amount of money and you could make something similar, but with less restrictions on your, your filmmaking process. And we'll stick that in cinemas. People yeah. go to watch it. People will go to watch anything. People will go to watch fucking trolls world tour or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> They'll watch anything you put in the cinema. I'll watch virtually anything you put in the cinema. Yeah. If I happen to be walking past and I've got time on my hands, I'll go in, I'll watch whatever's on. Yeah, I think it's um it's you you hit on something that I was saying to my husband earlier about how and we mentioned it briefly when we said that the seventies had that more gritty realist realism sort of dark cynical whatever and the the more recent of conspiracy thriller movies tend to end on a more positive note. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. You know, the guy solves the the situation. It's always a guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, he solves the situation. He he rescues someone. He does whatever it is he has to do, and he is celebrated. Hollywood um, ending. Yeah. Yeah, Hollywood ending. Whereas one of the things I like so much about some of these ones that we've talked before is that their endings are dark. They're bleak. They're pessimistic. Yes. And I love it. I love you a bleak mean, ending. You and me both. <laughs> Right, I want to sit there and be stunned. I want to think about it for days. I, I, I just love a bleak ending. <laughs> they, it, they genuinely provoke emotion from me. If if yeah. if I've got into this this character who's who's almost always an underdog, yes, almost always a man, um, and I, I've got into that character, and I desperately want them to succeed against all the odds and then when they yeah. don't and very often you don't get that um the the resolution doesn't happen until the actual final frames of the movie yes and it's just bang credits black screen there you go yeah have that yeah that's the end of that oh, oh i love, love that yeah right? it's such a gut punch really because is. you're so used to the standard you know movie setups and whatnot and when they do that to you, it's just such a gut punch. And really I, I love that. Yeah, you and me both. Whereas, like you say, with, with the newer attempts, very often there will be, not so much with the late 90s ones, but but with more recent <laughs> ones, very often there is that positive finale. And not just that, but the, the resolution happened and there's still 15, 20 minutes of the film left. Yeah. <laughs> to, for just weird vague niceties um (laughs) so yeah you spend the last 15 minutes watching something that isn't even part of the story essentially the story's over yeah and but we're just getting the nice cuddle at the end yeah we're we're getting the nice cuddle at the end which kind of i mean you said you felt like you're 100 years old early i i certainly feel like i'm 100 years and my brain can only take in so much new information 
Yeah. And if I if I watch a film and I'm I'm riveted by the the plot, and then it ends and it it ends in a way that I, I'm not particularly thrilled with, and then I've got another twenty minutes to get through before I can leave the cinema, it pushes yeah. all the good stuff out of my head. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, there are certain films where you just think, man, that really could have just ended there. Why do we need, you're a hero, and here's the parade, and yes. here's, oh, he gets back with the girl, it's fine, and all this tidying up of, of loose ends and things, which I don't need. Just cut it there. Bang. Absolutely. No need for it at all. Um, no. and, and while we're on the subject, um, there there is something that, that really grinds my gears if, if you if you're happy to hear me rant for a few moments <laughs> absolutely um can we talk about captain america the winter soldier okay um when i say can we talk i mean will you let me rant for a couple of minutes <laughs> yes i will <laughs> um, so the, it's the the second captain america film from from marvel studios um and i think it's it might be the first one that the Russo brothers did before they started doing everything, doing all those mad Avengers movies. And oh, yeah. in the run to its release, um, in in all the, the PR, the, the Russo brothers kept comparing it to the Parallax view. Really? When they were, when they were doing press, yes. It's like oh, a proper okay. 70s conspiracy thriller, they said. Um, <laughs> it's just like something made by Alan Pakular or Michael Crichton, they, they said. Fuck off. <laughs> they, they put Robert Redford in it and they set it in Washington, D.C. And that is and about that. it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, there's a Cold War angle, but it's 30 years after the fucking Cold War's ended. So that it doesn't make sense anyway. Um, right. There is some double crossing and you do have that whole um, you can't trust anybody thing about it. Yeah, yeah. But then at the 90 minute mark, you are then reminded for the last... 30 45 minutes of the film that what you're doing is you're watching a film about a man with a big shield a man with a metal arm and a man with wings all fighting on a giant spaceship <laughs> fuck off <laughs> <laughs> i must admit i don't really have a lot of time for these marvel superhero things because i've got like superhero fatigue you know i hit like a I hit a certain point where I was just like, I don't care about the Avengers anymore. I don't think I even watched the last one because I just don't care anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, that's fine. We've had so many of them. And I mean, Marvel and, and Disney have done incredibly well with them in that they've, like I was saying before, they've almost taken this blockbuster thing to its logical conclusion. Whereas, now it's not just about having big summer blockbusters. They've got to be Marvel superhero movies. You've yeah. got to have like ten of these released every year. Yeah. Um, and to the point where um, they tried doing it with Star Wars when they brought yes. Star Wars back for the the last three films. It wasn't just the last three films. It was all these filler films in between. It's like a new Star Wars every year until you die. Great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no thanks. So I, I get it. I do like the the Marvel films. I think as blockbusters go, I'd rather be watching them than say any Michael Bay movie, um, <laughs> yeah. because there does actually seem to be th there is an attempt to put real emotion in them, even if it is real emotion about people that you know can't possibly die because they're <laughs> made out of metal or yeah or they're. they're 30 foot tall and green um i i do enjoy them for what they are i will quite yeah, happily yeah. go and watch one in the cinema um yeah. quite happily but that one in particular really did fuck me over um <laughs> because they talked it up so much and all all the way through these these press things that were coming on the internet about it i'm like shut up shut up no it's not no, I yeah. know it's not going to be like the Parallax view. I know it's not going to be like Clute or All the President's Men because yeah. it's a film about superheroes. I mean, don't get me wrong. I do enjoy them um, uh, to a degree. I'm not like a super fan of, you know, Marvel and DC and Star Wars and all these things. I enjoy them for what they are. They're great. I'll watch probably more than once. But. I can't even remember which one it was, but at some point it was like there were three of them out in the cinema at once. And I was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. No, I want to watch something else. 
I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Um, but you reminded me actually of my reaction to the newest Halloween movie that oh. they released. Oh, if you will allow me to rant for just mm, one moment. Please do. I fucking hated it. Now, <laughs> I've watched it twice. I am so ready to watch it a third time. I want to buy a Blu-ray that has extras on it because I am convinced that they made a different film and for whatever reason, they had to butcher it to be what it is. <laughs> it was played up as this incredible, like, oh my, this is going to look at trauma. This is going to look at what it does to a person. This is, oh, it's so emotional. People were crying, you know, all that kind of jazz. Mm -hmm. And I watched it and I was so angry, <laughs> so angry. I was like, this doesn't address trauma. This doesn't address abuse. This, this is nonsense, is what this is. And it's so frustrating because I swear to God, they made a different film. There are moments of conversation in the film that make no sense. Mm -hmm. And I just assume there was a scene before that that they've cut out for whatever reason. And now this doesn't make sense. And nobody's clocked it. It, it, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> but in a weird way, I'm obsessed with it. You know, like I have to watch it again just to make sure that I really don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get that. I, I, I get that. Um, and, and I totally understand people who, who have that that mindset about it. And I think I, I, I've probably got an inkling as to where it comes from as well. I mean, I, I do like it. I am a fan of it insofar as it's better than most of the Halloween sequels. Um, I, I'm going to get slaughtered by some of my friends who are, who are huge fans of that franchise, but yeah. uh, the, the vast majority of them are terrible films. I, I don't... I, um, it's got some good ones. It's got some crap ones, but I'll still watch them because I love the Halloween franchise. Fair point. Um, In that case, I apologise. for That's, a, a that's fine. I will not... I will not take it personally. Um, it's just frustrating, especially because they try and paint Laurie as this alcoholic, out of control, terrible mother, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And they don't fucking show it. Yes. They're just telling you she's a terrible woman, a terrible mother, blah, 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 blah. And, and the whole time you're just like, no, sorry, I'm still on her side. I don't see that she's a terrible mother. You haven't shown me anything. Yeah, anger. <laughs> I yeah, I, I I totally get that. Um, it it was for me. It was it was a solid three star movie, three out oh. of five stars for me. I yeah. like it. It was a, a little above average, and mm. and a good way to while away two hours in the cinema. I didn't come out of it like I come out of so many modern movies, feeling like I've been cheated out of me, whatever it costs now, ten fifteen quid. Yeah. Um. So for that. It was fine for me. I really enjoyed um, seeing uh, the Laurie character again. I really yeah. enjoyed having Michael Myers back. I even yeah. enjoyed the fact that they've put wrinkles in his mask, even though it was <laughs> stupid. Yes. It worked for me. It worked so much for me because it, it reminded me that I'm, I'm, I'm watching this, what, what's basically become a, an inhuman ageless monster over the, the franchise that's gone before but if you're gonna have a film that you want to focus on um the effects of trauma and ptsd from from someone who's gone through something like that mm -hmm. don't get it written and directed by the people who did pineapple express yeah that was a bit of a red flag for me <laughs> I'm, I'm, but i there are some there's, there's some good stuff in it. I think that's why I'm a little bit obsessed with it and why I keep going back to it, even though I hate it. <laughs> there's there some really really is. good stuff in there. It's just there, not consistent. Yeah, there, there really is. And I, 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 I don't like to pigeonhole people. And I do think that anyone in, in any creative art should be able to move across genres and have a go yeah. at everything. Um, yeah. However... Uh, and I will say, I, I'm a big fan of David Gordon Green. I'm a big fan of Danny McBride. Um, mm. But if you're going to try to make, what they were trying to make was a seminal Halloween film, a film yes. that could really bookend with the original one. That's why they wiped out the, they, they retconned the, the whole 
franchise that had come since. Yes. If you're gonna I have do feelings that, about that as well. <laughs> oh, I bet you do, and I, I'm very willing to hear them. Uh, but if you're gonna do that, you need someone in that writing room and in that director's chair who really knows their craft and knows how to get the ideas that they're trying to get to translate onto the screen. And I yeah. think you're going to struggle if you've got people who some people would say are essentially James Franco's mates. Um, yeah. I, I would say they're very talented in their own right, particularly Danny McBride. I, I'm a, a big fan of, of pretty much everything he's done. But yeah. when, when him and David Gordon Green were announced as the, the writer director team for, for Halloween 2018, was it? Yeah. Seen it came out. Um, I, I was surprised and it tempered my expectations somewhat. Right. And it was right too. <laughs> um, it's so off topic. I'm so sorry. Uh, but yeah, it is just one of those films that pissed me off <laughs> yeah I, I totally get that <laughs> um but swinging it back once again towards conspiracy yes. theory movies Meanwhile, um, the 70s. <laughs> yeah, yes back in the 70s um is, is there a film that we haven't discussed that you want to bring up or recommend um is there do you know what there is um mm-hmm. There is, and it's it, it sends me into one of my other main loves, which is Italian cinema and Italian genre cinema. And that film is uh, Investigation of a Citizen Above Suspicion. Um, I have by, never by heard of that. Petri. It is wonderful. It's an absolute wonderful film, and you should drop what you're doing and go and watch it right away. Um, okay. So it was directed by Elio Petri, who um, prior to that had, had worked across a few genres. He did a, a comedy sci-fi movie with Jane Fonda called um, The Tenth Victim. Uh, he did, oh, yeah. Yeah, with, with her and, uh, and Marcello Mastroani. Um, he did uh, a thriller that was written by... Pasolini I think and then he he did a giallo and then he made this in 1970 and it is it is the epitome of a Kafkaesque nightmare what's it called again investigation of a citizen above suspicion um so it stars my favorite favorite actor in all of cinema Florinda Balkan um, a, an Argentinian actress who, who did most of her work in Italy. She's incredible. Um, and it also stars Gian Maria Volante in the in the, the main role. Yes, sorry, Moxie, it's got a male lead. Uh, <laughs> they all do! <laughs> not only is it from the 70s, it's from Italy. So, yes, you're damn right, it's chauvinistic. Um <laughs> And he, he plays like a, a recently promoted police inspector who he kills his mistress. He kills Florinda Balkan. And that, that's not a spoiler. It happens in the first few minutes of the film. Um, right. And then he spends the rest of the film covering up his involvement in the crime. But he he can't help but try to give himself away. And he insinuates himself into the investigation. And he keeps planting clues and dropping hints and saying things that should tip people off. And he gets more and more frustrated by the fact that they're not getting onto him and they're not <laughs> catching him. And it just carries on like that, like that. And I'm not going to go any further because I, I would delve into spoiler territory there. Yeah. That it's, sounds fantastic. It is a wonderful film. Um, it won an Academy Award. Uh, it won the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film in 1970. Um, oh, and from, I've heard of it. from that point on, in, certainly in Italy, Elio Petri became a bit of a superstar. In his homeland, he was revered in the same way that um, Fellini is revered or Pasolini or uh, Antonioni. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check this out. This sounds like uh, like my cup of tea. I do enjoy a bit of Italian cinema. I was actually hoping that you might come back on for another episode where we could talk about Italian horror. Oh, go on then. 
<laughs> Go on, then. Yes. Twisting me up. Is is there anything else that you wanted to highlight uh, about investigation? Oh, or... uh, in general, seventies uh, conspiracy thrillers in general. Is there another one that you might recommend? Or um, no, but I would okay. love if we have a few minutes to talk about one of the more recent ones, which I know you're a big fan of, and I'm as well. Arlington Road. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, let's talk about Arlington if, Road. <laughs> if there's room to talk about that, even for a couple of minutes. Um, that is one that, it's another one of those ones reached, I think, around the millennium, uh, maybe very, very late 90s. I feel like it was a 99, 98 maybe. Uh, 99. Hey, there you go. Hey. <laughs> um, and yes, it was one of those ones that was a, a calling card for the, the creative people that that made it but it's mm -hmm. just so damn effective it, it is. has such a fantastic cast um tim robbins is always incredible and he's incredible in this um yes. he can go from being lovable every man to the most evil person in the world yeah at, at, at the tip of a hat he does it <laughs> so so well He's so uh, good at playing sinister. Oh, he really is. He really is. Uh, yeah, and such range as well. I mean, if you look at he, he he's the same person who was the lead in the Shawshank Redemption. Where <laughs> yeah. You couldn't have more of a polar opposite, I don't think. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeff Daniels is, I think he is post the Big Lebowski Jeff Daniels. Oh, Jeff Bridges. Uh, Jeff Bridges. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Wrong Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Bridges, yes. Um, Jeff yeah. Bridges is, uh, I think he's post The Big Lebowski, Jeff Bridges at this point. So he is leaning into the absurd shouting a little bit, but because <laughs> of the film it is, it, it works. It works, yeah. Um, Joan Cusack is... How can you not love her? <laughs> oh, to say that the script gave her very little to do, she is fantastic. She is, yeah. Um, She's one of the most memorable things for me, actually, after, when it first came out and I watched it. Um, it was her performance that kind of stuck with me. Good. Yeah, it, it, it was with me as well and, mm -hmm. and remains um, because she you really do get an instant feel that she is something really sinister. Like I, she could be a, a Russian sleep agent yeah. housing as this all-American suburban mom. Yeah. And she can do it with just uh, a look. Yeah. That that actor can do more with a look than most can do with a page of dialogue. <laughs> and she's, she's wonderful. Because they never give her any fucking dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's just like a sinister, quiet observer. Yeah. And the, the one thing that, even though I like them when they're done well, that bugs me about those films that came out around the turn of the millennium that, that kind of tried to revive the conspiracy thriller, they all became about the twist. Yeah. They were always about the, the last minute turning the tables on you. And you're, ha ha, he was the bad guy all along, which, which now feels really contrived because so many people have done it. But with yeah. Allenson Road, just as he's driving in to that underground car park at the, at the FBI offices. Yeah few minutes and it suddenly dawned on me and I was just like oh you fucking beauty <laughs> you absolute fucking beauty I did not see that coming at all absolutely fantastic. performances are fantastic um the the screenplay is so tight which is why I was mm. so surprised to find out that that Aaron Kruger's gone on to write the Transformers films yeah um, oh and the, the score isn't that um Angelo Badalamenti. Oh, my dad. I love him. <laughs> His music so is so perfect. Yeah. Um, I think I think we're both pretty big David Lynch fans, are we? Yes. Am I right about that? Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And his collaborations with David Lynch are just perfection. But, Literal perfection. Yeah. As, as creative personas as, as artists they complement each other so so well that you really really notice when you're watching the david lynch film that battle of Mente hasn't scored yes 
Yes. Uh, it's kind of the same with um, De Palma and, oh, goodness, I've forgotten his name. The guy that does a lot of his scores. We have no um, answer, I'm afraid. Oh, God, I can't think of his name. That's terrible. Oh, anyway, um, <laughs> Pino Dinaggio. Dinaggio, I'm sure that's him. Um, his music, much like Lynch and Angelo, it just it creates perfection and it works so well and it's and you can tell when that person isn't doing the score because something is just ever so slightly missing yes absolutely absolutely um yeah battle mini score is incredible <laughs> as it always is yeah yeah um there's some other good um conspiracy thrillers that are sort of post 70s mm. um that we don't necessarily need to get into but i just want to give a shout out to um films like blowout um yes. silkwood um oh yes and halloween three season of the witch my yes. favorite halloween film i'm throwing it out there is it i, yeah. I really like it <laughs> i am um... Yeah, I, I love that film. And I know it's one of those that it's gone back and forth between being hated by everyone to being loved by yes. everyone to being yes. reappraised and uh, and whatnot. And it's almost like the, the, the last word's already been, been said on it, but I, I do love that film. Yes. Such a fun, fun thriller. It is. It is. What's um, the Osterman weekend? Did you add that? To my list. Yes. So the Osterman weekend is um directed by Sam Peckinpah. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's it's very typically a, a Sam Peckinpah film in the around about halfway through it starts feeling like a western. <laughs> even though it's not a western. Um yeah. so obviously he, he made his name on films like The Wild Bunch. Um some yeah. of the, the greatest westerns made that that didn't come out of Italy. Um, yeah. And it's got such an incredible cast um, to it. You've got, um, now I'm going to have to bring it up because otherwise I'm going to start homing and yeah. hiring. I'm just looking through it now and I'm stunned that I haven't heard of this film. John Hurt, yes. Chris Sarandon, Dennis Hopper, Burt Lancaster, Rutger Hauer, mm-hmm. Meg Foster. Yep, like, yep. This is ticking so many boxes. I'm I'm stunned. Wonderful, okay. wonderful cast. Um, who who are all absolutely fantastic in it. I'm a, a huge Rock Hour fan. I'm a big Meg Foster fan. Um, I'm I've I've got such a crush on Chris Sarandon as I'm sure <laughs> everybody does. Yes. <laughs> um, he he was he was one of the one of the first men in film that confused me in quotes. <laughs> <laughs> it's understandable though he's a good looking fella. Come he's on, se- sexiest vampire that ever lived. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, this cast is crazy. And you've got John Hurt running absolute rings around them all. Oh, he's having so much fun in this film. As he he's he plays the the kind of almost typical guy pulling the strings, guy who you don't know whether he's on your side or not, or if he's got his his own um, his own dastardly plot going on, <laughs> and he's he's acting everybody else off the page, um, no matter how good the rest of the cast are, because he, he's John fucking hurt, um, yeah, and he's oh he's chewing scenery, he's <laughs> he's having so much fun on this film. And it's one that it is, I, I guess the first half of it, it feels like you're watching something like All the President's Men. It's it's all very contained. It's all very claustrophobic. And everything everybody says has a dual meaning. And then at the halfway point, it, it just goes completely OTT and turns into essentially a, a mad shootout. This sounds brilliant. <laughs> it really is. It does it so well. It's not generally considered one of Peking Pa's best films, but mm. even Peking Pa's worst films tend to be better than most people's <laughs> films. Um, and it's, 
yeah, I, I love it. I I rewatched it for this because I had it in my head that it must have been made in the seventies. Um, it turns out it's uh, 83, 83, is it? 83, yeah. yeah. 83. Um, close, I, close, but no cigar. <laughs> it, really do, it really does feel like one actually made in the 70s. It almost feels like Pecking Pie's got to the genre just a few years too late. Um, yeah. Made it in 76 or 77. It would very firmly sit in that pantheon with... Oh. Clute and the conversation and, and coma and all the other ones we've talked about yeah yeah oh well i'm definitely going to check this out thank you for uh recommending it do check that out and uh investigation of a citizen under oh. suspicion yeah um one of many 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 italian films have a classic singular um score made by none other than sergio leone Oh, that his name popped up when I typed it into Google and I was going to mention it and then we got carried away with something else. The, the recently departed Sergio Leone. Rest yes. In peace. Um, well, I suppose that's a good place to end this, I think. Um, I've asked all the questions that I wrote down, I think. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you would like to add? No, you... you um... You, you let me have all my rants that I had <laughs> about certain films and certain aspects. You, you humoured those very well, thank you. And um, no, I, th- I think we've got through everything I was looking forward to, to talking about. Oh, good, good. Um, um, yeah, yeah I, I would just like to say thank you so much for inviting me on. Um, no, such, thank you for agreeing to do this. Such wonderful, wonderful films, and, and it is—it's probably the the third of my film obsessions after Italian genre cinema and um, the the films of Fritz Lang and, and German expressionism. This is this is the third set of, of films that that really sits in my wheelhouse, and I never get to talk about them. So thank you. You are so welcome, so welcome. And thank you for doing this. Thank you for your patience, because I knew this took a while to to get ready. Um, and I, I hope that you'll be happy to come back and talk to me about Italian horror and Fritz Lang. Certainly will. Absolutely. Excellent. Certainly will. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Moxie. You are very welcome, Matt. I'll put a little link to your uh, Twitter and whatnot in the description okay. uh, if you're happy for people to come Don't and find you. Struggle with my Twitter at the moment because I have oh, just that's... deactivated. Oh, that's uh, right. Well, don't don't worry. I won't. Um, but uh, if if you're gonna put a link, um, uh, it would be wonderful to have a link to my um, writer's page on Diabolique magazine. Absolutely, I will put a link in the description below. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you guys at home for listening. I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, I have no idea who I'll be talking to next. Uh, so it'll be a surprise for everybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give us a thumbs up if you like the video. Um, and that's it. Sweet screams. <laughs>